Today's topic um, is changes changing, um, and we, we wanted to just cover a few of the things around change, so improvement, innovation, disruptive innovation, um, and then also have a, um, a go at connecting up some people um, while you're here. We also need to acknowledge that some of the material that we've got for this has come from um, the, an NHS, NHS white paper, um, which was actually put out in 2014. It's a digital white paper, and so it's got lots of really good video links and stuff in it. Um, and it's about the new era of thinking and practice in change and transformation. So we have stolen with pride some of the things from that. The um, idea that change is changing and that we need to be able to um, respond to and be part of change, I guess, is becoming it's, not, it, it's no longer an option um, and that um, we need to change to keep up and staying still isn't going to get us um, any further in our organisation. Um, and that we all know that you know part of the change is so rapid a part of the um, technology is one is one element of um, how fast change is occurring and one of the things I was just we were talking about phones and um, technology and I managed to find my first cell phone <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we know that wasn't that long ago so we're going from bricks to um, our handheld computers um, with a lot of power, which Dean will talk about in a minute. The other thing that we're looking at is consumer power and definitely the much greater relationship that we have as far as the knowledge that people have of their own conditions, their own way that they manage their health within their own families um, and their own way of living um, as far as um, our ne negotiated partnerships for changing the way and how we do things. Um, and I guess we kind of acknowledge that while changing is ha change is happening fast, we also are selling a bit of a message of we need to do it in um, incremental steps. Not doing anything is not an option, but we often think we want to get here, and sometimes it's about doing small bits and in, in, the, in the journey to there. In fact, there have hardly been any big changes over time that haven't happened with steps at a, at a time rather than a big jump. It doesn't happen very often that there's a huge jump that everybody has to take together. It usually happens over time. Um, doing our small tests of change, which if you haven't done your IHO Open School training, here's the plug, we'll get it done at the beginning. Um, we'll probably at the end as well. And at the end. Yeah. Um, but teaches you that although it's about fast, the fast doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be huge jumps. It's about just taking the opportunity and going and doing it now, not waiting till tomorrow or the next day. So I guess this speaks volumes to me, particularly I've got two children, one's eight and one's 11, and their life is ruled by the social speak. Um, they are all about what Corey Kenshin on YouTube is doing. They're all about what the, their favorite YouTuber doing, and lo and behold, whatever their favorite YouTubers are doing ends up being spread through the whole school, through every school that I've heard of, everything from all our friends in Wellington all the way up here in a matter of a few weeks. My kids have just started playing such and such. Oh yeah, so have mine. Um, my son is absolutely obsessed by the new games that he can be involved in. He has, at the age of 11, signed himself up to be a games tester for, for Steam, for anyone who knows what that is. Um, and so now, He's been part of the work, free workforce for them to road test games and things before they actually get released. It is all about this power of connectivity and using every single mechanism that they've got. Um, but I guess in my own life I've noticed a lot of things have changed as well. Um, when I first started out in the health profession, everything was in a paper diary and you wrote everything down and you, know, and you had to wait till you got back to your desk to read your emails or to write a document or, um, or that sort of thing. Now, my whole life revolves around my phone. My phone is my diary, it's my reminder, it's my PA. It is where I read things, it's where I jot down all my ideas and know that I can find them later on, no matter where I am. Um, and if I lose my phone, just God help me, excuse the expression, because um, I couldn't do it without it. But with that, you know, we were talking this morning that um, 
Oh, probably a few years ago, phones were getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the batteries, you know, they'd last you a week, you might plug it in once a week. Now my phone I have to charge every single day because I'm using it so much, yet the battery technology is much better, which just shows how much you start to use these things. Um, so I'm not sure if anybody's read anything by Clayton Christensen. So basically what the, the argument about disruptive innovation is that um, it's kind of the power from below um, and it's, it's the, how industries transform to provide increasingly affordable items and that they end up being adopted um, by services to the consumer. Um, and so one of, the, one of the examples of this, we're kind of just going to skip and then we'll go back to something, but one of the examples is um, how we use these cell phones. So the, organi the organisation, our organisation culture is starting to, to change due to the nature of how we communicate with, with a, a smartphone. Um, and, and that's part of, that's a part of disruptive innovation. Um, so we might go to the next slide and we'll come back to, to how cell phones have been a, are a disruptive. So when we're looking at the way change happens, things are, are moving forward at quite a rapid pace. On the left you've got what has been the dominant hierarchical approach of the way change is done. We think about things very carefully, we analyse them to death almost to the point of procrastination, or to the point of procrastination. Um, we have a mission, we have a vision, everything's driven by the hierarchy of the organisation. Um, leadership decrees what it is that we're going to do and we all work towards that. It's all very logical. It's very logical and things are measured by transactions. So what actually happens? What's happening throughout the world is much more social. It's being driven much more by the social drive within communities that people want to belong to a shared vision. They want to um, be involved in shared ideas, stuff that has meaning for all of us. And what that means is that doing stuff by analysis and what looks right on paper and in the numbers isn't always selling the message. And what's becoming much more um, of, a, of a theme is that people are being driven by how they think about things and what's important to them um, and how they're influenced by their social communities in terms of what's important and that's how change is coming about rather than what by the analysis needs to happen. Now it's nice if you can have the two to meet the needs of all the different generations, but um, when we're talking about millennials and the younger generations, they're being a lot, driven a lot more by what they feel is right, um, what they can be involved in, how they can be part of a community moving in the same direction. Um, and that's what we, we, that's what we see when it's making sense through emotional connection rather than through the analytics. Um, and it's what it comes with all the social interactions, all the networks that people have, is that open approaches to sharing ideas, data, co-creating, and that the sticking within one organisation is not going to create change across the system at all. Have to start pushing out through all the boundaries within the system to get any sort of meaningful change for the outcomes. Did you want to use your yep. Yeah, so um, sort of back to, back to the smartphone example. So if you think about uh, 20, 30 years ago, um, a tea room in a hospital, um, there were groups of people gathered around formica tables, probably, with teacups and saucers, and I just I have this picture in my head of the noise that was in a big tea room like that. Um, pe people's pages <laughs> going off left, right and centre, probably one phone on the wall for people queuing up to, to answer, the, answer the pager, um, to kind of now where actually you've got quite a few people over the road at a caravan um, getting cups of coffee and actually communicating all of their stuff that they need, like Jen said, looking up potentially, depending on the calibre of your phone, results, or but definitely responding to pages via text. So one of the things that's changed, and the, and the reason that you could use a smartphone as an example of a uh, disruptive innovation, is that the power through connection. So we're not no longer reliant on a person having to ring the operator after being paged, be put through to, or have some level of filtering about whether you have enough status to be put through to the person you want to be put through to. Um, and having uh, you know, a hierarchical system of, of, of communication. 
these days you just get someone's cell number, you just get their number and you can talk straight to that person and you don't need to go through a, a series of, um, of hierarchical. The importance of being connected because it's, it seems that phone numbers are being passed around of someone that you're already connected to and sometimes that can start with the face to face. So the more that we are able to understand who each other is and what role they have, you've got this element of trust. And so certainly, I mean, in Fakatani, I'll give an example, is that the consultants and the house officers definitely share their numbers. And so there's no longer reliant on rec responding to a pager and going through a series of steps. There is just one, um, one system. But the way that we issue phones is still somewhat hierarchical because the people that own the DHB phone um, versus uh, some of the junior staff who are just using their own phone. So that's a disruptive element. There's 77% of us own a smartphone. People are not going to not use it because the hierarchy of an organisation says. They're going to start making those grassroots connectivity. So yeah, perhaps Joe, knowing that there is a phone that will answer your call, <laughs> um, whoever's holding that, um, Cha changes the nature of how we how we connect to each other. GPs are just as bad. We to each other. You can't get it to us either. No. Yeah. <laughs> so we're arguing that those are the kinds of things that will will change. Um, and I guess from a, um, I can only speak from my own personal the way programs and projects and things are starting to run. It's more about the talking with lots of different people to make something happen, rather than the let's write this big long plan, although we do do documentation. <laughs> um, you know, the plan itself is not the importance, the discussion and the connections that come about to make the plan is what makes the difference. Um, and then the communication of what's happened and the gaining that emotional connection about something good that's happening in the organisation and why it makes sense is the what makes the difference and that's what makes the change. Not the writing the document that's a sideline, it's the talking with people, it's the getting people to support you because, you know, stuff can be hard, change can be really hard, um, and so the more people you can get around you that support and help make it happen, the better, I guess. Right, your turn. <laughs> so, what we'd like to do is if we're going to live our philosophy, um, is we want to connect a few people up. And the idea is that we are going to um, give you an idea and use the elevator speech concept of if you were in, had the chance to connect to somebody and you've only got a couple of minutes, how are you going to sell what you are currently doing? Um, a project that you might be working on, a problem that you're trying to, to solve. Um, yeah, so... We are going to allow some time now, 15, 20 minutes. We want probably at least four different connections with the people that are in this room to a result at the end of the exercise. We are going to ask you to in group, to turn around. We thought everybody might be nicely lined up in two rows, but yeah, we were pretty we'll optimistic. <laughs> um, turn to... First of all, turn to someone you don't know, and then we're going to swap three or four times, we'll just see how time goes. So by the end of the exercise, you will have talked to three different people that you don't normally talk to. The questions are, oops, no, this one. Uh, what's your story? So you imagine that you're in an elevator. Um, luckily, there's actually no one sitting at the Whakatani Inn, because there's not going to be any elevators there. Um, the, the doors open, you walk in, You've got 20 seconds to give a brief something that's happening. This is how you get your story out. So there's two aims to this. Firstly, it's practicing your speech about what you might be doing. And secondly, within this room, we will have shared with four people something that you're doing that they might not have known nothing about. Because as a service improvement team, we hear a lot about, oh, it'd be so nice if we knew what all the different projects were that were out and about. Um, we don't hear anything about this sort of thing. So this is starting that communication. And to get that, you've got to be really succinct and really sharp so that somebody remembers it. So the first thing is what was the problem and get a hook, a story. 
So for our home care medical and the acute demand, the story was if you phone up after hours. Yeah, so we do the, we'll pretend the role play. So the lift door's open, right? <laughs> Jen's in the lift. Button, hang, ding. stand there. Oh, Jen. Hi, Fiona. How are you going? What are you up to at the moment? Oh, acute demand, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> but we've got this really cool initiative. Do you know what happens if you phone after hours and you can't get through to anyone? You get told there's an 0900 number to phone. It's going to cost you $50 for five minutes and $5 every minute thereafter. So what are people going to do? Yeah. There's no way they can get any help. So we're putting in an initiative so that they can at least get through to a nurse. If they phone their GP, it'll get diverted straight through. Oh, wow. Simple. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, right. so that it's, kind of it's just really sharp. And, you know, if there's not a project you're specifically working on, it can just be an idea of something you're changing at home. It doesn't have to be a work-related example. Something simple, but you're thinking about why is it important, what are we doing, and what, are we, what have we achieved? We are going to hear from just a, about three or four minutes long, five minutes, five minutes long um, from one of the gurus of trying to connect people up, um, Helen Bevan from the NHS. This is a film imagining the future of change and people leading change. For some people watching this, it'll create a sense of hope and possibility. For others, it might actually create more difficult questions than it provides answers. But this is about imagination and our imagination should be the only limit on what we can hope to have in the future. So let's be ambitious about that future. So, it's 2024, and in this imagined future, after a decade of transformation, health and healthcare outcomes are improving exponentially. So what happened? Well, lots of things happened, but a specific breakthrough came 10 years ago. In 2014, we realised that it wasn't enough to focus on what we wanted to change. You know, the technical things, the structures and processes. It wasn't enough to plan how future care might be organised and delivered operationally or draw another roadmap for emerging technology. In 2014, we decided to focus as much of our energy on how to make the change happen. How we could mobilise people who use health services and their families, people who work in the health and care system and our partners who contribute to health and social care. How we could build a massive sense of shared purpose with everyone playing their role, creating thousands of everyday actions for improvement. A new breed of change leaders was activated. They have infected our health and care system in a positive way with deep viral change. We have redefined who leads change and how we do it, and our patients and population now reap the benefits. So who are the change leaders of 2024, and how are they changing the world? We are a community, a movement of change leaders united by a deep, shared purpose. We are hyper-connected to each other, and we collaborate digitally across the globe. We are many not just a few. We span boundaries and organisations. We're connected through networks, not hierarchy. We are doers, not just talkers or thinkers, and our actions have created benefits for hundreds of thousands of patients and families. And after a decade of change, we spend less time running discrete improvement programmes and more time connecting people, ideas and knowledge. We spend less time identifying the best solutions and more time on making sense of things together. We spend less time trying to replicate best practice and more time having transformational conversations, listening, telling stories and uh, ensuring everyone's voice is heard. 
Diversity is at the heart of everything we do. Diversity of thought, experience and background. Diversity, disruption and dissent are now essentials in the way we go about change. There is a role for the disruptive innovators, the rebels, the radicals, the mavericks. Many different voices bring in many opportunities for new thinking and innovation. We still acknowledge the wisdom and evidence base behind established methods of change. And we seek to build new ways in our world that is increasingly open, sharing ideas, comparing data, and co-creating change. So change leadership has become a much more significant, more interconnected component of the way that we do things. Change leadership now plays into everything that we do, every day, and how we go about getting things done, regardless of our status or how much formal authority we have in the system. In our brave new world of 2024, every leader is a change leader. <laughs>